everyone. Hello, everyone. In this video, in this episode of Director Discussions, I am honored to sit down with now one of my new best friends, the amazing Zach Craig. I mean, where do I begin? The director behind one of the biggest films in the world right now, Barbarian, which you might have checked out in theaters, you absolutely should, an amazing film. Uh, but besides Barbarian, you may recognize Zach from The Whitest Kids You Know. But Zach, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me, sir. How are you doing today? I'm well. Thank you so much for having me, man. Yeah, I'm such a charmer. The second I had you on, you I said to myself, you know what? Why don't I tell him this is the peak of his career? So the second he came on, I go, you know what, Zach? This is the peak of your career chatting with me. So, I mean, yeah, already we got off. And, the and I 100% I agree. I don't I mean, disagree. Yeah, you know, you're, you're filmmaking, you know, numerous millions at the box office. I'm sure that only means so much. Would you like to hear my story about me seeing Barbarian? All right, so. I mean, I'm going to tell it to you anyway, so I don't really care whether or not you do. I mean, people are here to see you, but let me take the spotlight for a minute. Um, every Halloween, me and my dad watch a film, and this year we went to cinemas, and now I have an irrational fear of being denied at the cinemas, you know? And it, because Barbarian was an 18s film, I was thinking, okay, I mean, look, you know, if the camera doesn't show, but I'm seven foot, you know, tall, and I have rippling muscles, but it's off camera, so you, you can't really tell, but I, I look like a bodybuilder, and I look really tall, but I was just so nervous for, like, like, I'm tall, but I was so nervous, they'd say, like, oh, it's 18s, you're not allowed in, so I, I wore jeans, because I was thinking in my head, listen, there's no kid that wears jeans, they have, they're gonna have to let me in, and I put socks in my shoes, and I was walking so funny and I, I didn't really work. And I've done this before. I've done it for Suicide Squad by James Gunn that came out and I did it for the black phone. And like, I'm tall enough to get in, but at the same time, I was so nervous. I was practicing my story. I was like, all right, I'm born a year beforehand. If they ask for my passport, I'll just say I don't have it on me. And I went in and we had our tickets booked and we went into the cinema and the guy just said, oh yeah, just screen there. He did not care at all. And I got in, so... You know. But even if you go with your dad, like in the States, if you go with a parent, the, your parent can just say, he's coming in. and, and they, they For real? Care. Oh, well, then yeah, I just yeah. have to emigrate to the States, man. I don't know. I was in the car. I, I had this <laughs> With your lot. dad. I, I had it. I was, no, but here's the thing. Whenever we go to the cinema, my dad's deaf, so we watch it with captions. I think in America, you can wear glasses that come with captions. We don't have that here in Ireland. Uh, but oh, I've never heard of that, of glasses with captions. I didn't really? know. Really? I mean, we went to a cinema when, when we were on holiday in America to see, I think, I forget, I think it was Ant-Man at the time. But there were these glasses you'd put on and the subtitles would pop up on glasses and it was so, wow. so weird. But uh, it's really That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, but uh, normally whenever we go, because they're captioned, it, it doesn't tend to be too busy, the cinemas. But Barbarian, it actually was rather busy, you know, and it was on Halloween as well. So not bad, you know. Having, yeah, having, take having, it. All right. having a busy enough cinema but there you go so that's my story that's about great. how i snuck in to see your film so we're oh hey well i'm i'm glad you did i paid so i mean i assume i'm a couple million on that box office i don't know how that works it's the exchange rate i think about eight quid here must translate to a few million in the states it's the i think that's right I, goes i'm sure you're on I'm in lower yeah, level yeah. maths, so I mean, you know, I just pin it all on filmmaking, baby. I don't need school. I stopped listening to that two years ago. Uh, but no, first things first, let me ask you this. A film like Barbarian, I mean, how cool mm -hmm. is it? Because this was made, was it a four million budget, something like that? Four and a half. Four and a half million budget. Now, I don't know if you know the filmmaker Duncan Jones. He directed Moon and a lot of- Yeah, yeah, of, of course. Life. Yeah, I, and uh, Moon was actually made also on a four million budget. And now- you know, although like four million, obviously a huge number it, for a film, it's it's rather low budget. So, I mean, making yeah. a horror film for four and a half million. I mean, did you face any constraints in that? Did you did it force you to almost become creative? Because that's what Dun Duncan found. He was almost forced to become more creative. Well, Barbarian is not a very, you know, uh, it doesn't need a lot necessarily. Now, now, I don't think there's any universe where I could have filmed it in the States at that budget level. But what we did is we filmed it in Bulgaria. And so in Bulgaria, four and a half million actually goes a really long way. And so we were able to um, really get a lot of bang for our buck. Now, the problem with shooting in Bulgaria is that nothing looks remotely American because the architecture really? is, is completely alien to what we have in the States. And for a movie that takes place in Detroit, there's just no possible way I could make use of the existing you know landscape over there so what we had to do and this is only possible in bulgaria um or maybe you know some of the other some of the other countries over there um but we were able to to take a lot of that budget and put it towards construction and so that the block that our house sits on that whole block we basically built from scratch we erected about 13 facades 
of these other houses. You know, I, I had a lot of like reference material from Detroit. And so we would like pick different houses from a lot of footage that you can find on YouTube and going there and photographing and things like that. Yeah. Um, and so we just, we built 13 facades of houses uh, in a field. And then that, that became our, our set basically. And then all of the under house, you know, tunnels yeah. and basements and the whole house. I mean, everything inside the house, that's all built on a soundstage. And really? so if we were to try and do all of that in the States, you know, we're looking at 15, 20 million, but, but over there we were able to do it for, for a very reasonable price. That's so fascinating. I mean, you could take that. That's really, I never even, you know, considered that before. That would be different shooting in Bulgaria. And um, But no, let, let me just, let me take you back to when you were a young boy, you know. And let me say real quick, also, we did film in Detroit. I, ju I also have to say, like, so I don't want people to think we're total phonies. Like, we did yeah. go to those actual neighborhoods and we filmed her moving through them. And, and so there's a lot of actual Brightmore in the movie, but our, our block that the house it's on is all constructed. Okay, sorry, what were you going to say? Uh, you know, I mean, no, that that's great. I mean, but let me ask you this, you know, let me take you back a couple hundred years ago when you were a young boy. Were you a horror yeah. fan? Was horror something you were into growing up? I mean, I'm a fan of all movies, you know, I'm yeah. a movie fan. So um, it's not like I was only into horror, but I love, I've always liked horror. Yeah. Um, but, you know, like my favorite filmmakers are, are like, you know, the Coen brothers and, you know, Stanley Kubrick and, yeah. you know, it, it, living filmmakers you know like fincher and bennett miller and those kinds of people are like who i'm i'm obsessed with so it's not necessarily like i'm a horror focused person when i write for whatever reason my little creative tuning fork vibrates when i think about horror yeah. so you know i've also written a lot of things that are not horror but like lately i'm just i'm interested in it you know i i think movies like get out and hereditary really inspired me and oh, yeah. um you know, and like when I watched Hereditary, I was like, I just need more of this. And there's not much more like that, you know, like yeah. Hereditary is a very unique movie. And I, it just, it created this need in me to see more grown up, intelligent, like ruthless horror. And there just isn't that much of it out there. So I was like, okay, well, I'll make one. Um, yeah. So that's, that's part of it. Dude, and you, I mean, you totally succeeded in that. But I mean, I'm sure this is a question you've been faced with so much. But I've chatted with, like, like I've been really fortunate with the filmmakers I've gone to chat with. And something, I forget who mentioned it, but I mean, I've chatted with some comedy directors recently. David Dobkin, who directed Wedding Crashers, who's an amazing... I, I've worked with David. You've worked with David Dobkin, you know? Yeah, yeah. When have you worked with David? Um, God, it was probably like eight, eight or nine years ago, maybe 10 years ago. Um, he directed an episode of a TV show that I acted in, um, the show called like friends with benefits that like nobody, nobody saw in the States. It totally it's flopped. small world, you know, I mean, he's, yeah, but, he's but he directed nice an episode guy. of that. Yeah. Dude, small world. I mean, he's, he's a really nice guy. That that's crazy. I mean, that that's really amazing. It just shows. Uh, but yeah, and I think it was him. We talked about it with maybe, maybe it was someone else, but I mean, I'm sure there's some psychological reason I'm not smart enough to understand, but comedy and horror, I mean, they almost kind of mesh. Uh, well, I mean, you you know, uh, nowadays you see a lot of filmmakers meshing genres and some totally work more than others. And I feel like horror and comedy is something that kind of just goes together so well. And I know, obviously, you came from comedy. Do you think that, what is it about comedy and horror that you feel just go so well together? I think they're both, um, they both use the same math, you know? So they're both about... Yeah creating a visceral reaction from the viewer and to do that they use timing and tone and so you know the anatomy of a scare is very similar to the anatomy of a joke it's about it's about being one step ahead of the audience and it's about zigging when they expect you to zag in a way that will elicit a visceral reaction and so um i feel like all my time as a comedy writer director actor all that stuff was just me going to the gym and working out almost the exact same muscle group that a horror director needs to have. And, um, and so I, I think I'd been kind of preparing for this for a long time. Yeah. And that's, that's the funny thing about comedy. I think, you know, I don't know what it is, but I mean, we watch comedy. I don't think anyone can like, you know, I mean, when people watch a horror, I feel like they, they'll tend to appreciate it much more than they would if they're watching a comedy, especially as a director. But the truth is directing comedy is very hard, you know, whether it's, it's very hard. The beats in between the scene. I mean, something's not funny. You put two seconds behind it, all of a sudden it's funny. You put in a reaction exactly. shot. Two seconds, try like two frames. There, are, There is like, it is, it is, everybody will tell you who's directed comedy, the difference between a laugh and a dead beat is like one frame, you know? Really? And I, no, it, it matters. Like those little tiny, like micro moments 
can be life and death. And it's crazy because the only real way to know if you're if you're succeeding is to show it to an audience and yeah. and test it. You know, um, I am a big fan of like testing the movie, like showing it to a crowd, getting the feedback. You know what they say? Like, yeah. you know, audience members co- individually, they're idiots. Collectively, they're geniuses. <laughs> you know, and that's true. Like you cannot argue with a crowd of people. Like if they're laughing, it's working. If they're not, yeah. it's not. You cannot... You cannot rationalize that away, and so um, you know one of the one of the hard things for me of, of moving from comedy to horror is like, um, you know, with horror, a lot of what I prefer in horror is not necessarily the big jump scare. I actually don't really like jump scare movies very much. I think they're cheap. Uh, I have jump scares in Barbarian. Don't get me wrong; yeah. I'll use them. But if a movie is just a series of jump scares, like I think it's it's not for me. Um, and and so what I really want out of my movies is creeping dread. You know, my my favorite moments from horror movies is like in The Shining when Danny turns left on the big yeah. wheel down the hallway and he sees the two little girls. No one's screaming and and like oh my god, you know, like it's it's just a horrible horrible moment and it just it's a slow thing, you know. Like yeah. I I reacted. That was the first time I was terrified watching a movie and I didn't make an audible sound. And so it's hard for me. What I'm getting at is like. As a horror director, I as well as I could if it's a comedy. Because with, with, with the comedy, there's a quantifiable reaction. It's volume. You know, they're laughing or they're not. But like, yeah. I can't really tell you if there's a creeping dread setting in on this room or not. I have to ask people afterwards and trust them, you know, that they're not just being polite to me. So that, that is a hard, that, that's one of the challenges of, of changing genres for me. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, Mike Flanagan, who's one of my favorite horror directors of all time, he's just so good. I was talking to him and he mentioned how, you know, he he too has that same thing with jump scares because building tension is kind of horror. And when, you know, when there's a jump scare, it alleviates the tension, it kind of cuts the tension in half and you can ease it up. But I mean, and I think there's one scene, obviously, where, you know, I don't want to spoil it too much. Someone was in the cave and it was very slow and the tension was really building there. I remember seeing that in cinemas and like, the tension keeps going and keeps going to the point where like you're like okay I want it to stop and you kind of close your eyes and you open them and the scene's still going and the tension is still building but that that's such an amazing you know amazingly fascinating point with comedy and horror because you do have to craft comedy as much as you do have to craft horror and I mean you know when you're crafting a horror film did you learn any specific tricks that maybe some other horror filmmakers have used was there anything you found insightful from other horror directors or was yeah you know so um so we cut the movie together and we tested it. It tested really well. We were really happy with it. And then we were going to do another uh, round of testing. And uh, Roy Lee is the producer yeah. of Barbarian. He's also produced It and The Ring and The Grudge and like you know, also The Departed and Lego. I mean, he's like done a ton of amazing movies. Um, the yeah. guy is great. I love him. Um, but he's done a ton of horror movies. He's done so many. And and he has this, there's this man that he loves to use named Kevin Groydert. And Kevin has directed, he's edited like all the Saw movies. He's directed a couple Saw movies. And But what Roy uses him on is like, kind of like his silent assassin. He'll bring him onto every horror movie and he'll just have Kevin go through and do like a scare punch up if the director wants. You know, he doesn't force it on anybody, but he's like, if you want, just get a second set of eyeballs. Kevin is great at like crafting scares. And like, um, you know, if you want to use him, use him. I was like, of course I want that. Like for yeah. me, my, I think of it being a director as like, I am the... I have to have ideas and opinions and like, and, and um, fixed you know, fixed notions of what the movie wants to be. But I also need to be receptive to everyone else's idea. Because if somebody yeah. has an idea that's better than mine, that's only good for the movie and ultimately good for me. It makes me look smarter. So I am so, like, solicitous of everybody on set. Like, bring me yeah. all your crazy ideas. Bad ideas are okay here. Like, I I am not ever going to get mad at somebody for, like, pitching a bad idea. Because sometimes you got to pitch nine bad ideas to get to the tenth good one. So anyway, yeah. that's... So I was like so thrilled to have Kevin come in and like just take a look at the scares and do some tweaks here and there. And what he taught me um, was two things. One, don't be afraid to really use the sound. That In a horror movie, the sound is more important than the visual. And you can really um, save non-scary scenes with really awesome audio. That was great. 
Um, sorry, my shit's blowing up here. Let me turn this off. Um, no but, but the other thing that I thought was really counterintuitive is, is like when you when you are building a jump scare, you show the thing, like you know, the thing appears, and then instantly, as soon as you are able to, you cut to the reaction of the person. And I was like, that doesn't seem right. I want to watch the thing. He's like, no, no, no. He's like, you, the thing, and then you cut to the person, and then you can go back to the thing. But like the actual scare, the actual visceral like release happens when you're looking at the person reacting. And th that is something I'm still kind of struggling to to, to d decide if I believe it or not. Yeah. But he did that with like, there's a couple of moments. And like, for example, when Tess first sees Keith crawling out of the dark, yeah. the barbarian, you know, like his cut of that is better than my cut of that. And, and it's the cut that's in the movie is his cut of that. And it's when Keith appears and we cut to Tess recoiling. And then we cut back to Keith and it, it just, it just does work. Or like when, um, when the mother is running towards AJ in the dark hallway, you know, from the yeah. distance, like the first time we see her, we cut to AJ recoiling and it just, it lands it. I don't know why, but it does, it does work. So that was something to answer your question that an old horror pro taught me is, is that, you know, I had, um, I had a lot of conversations with, um, a lot of hard directors, you know, and and one one that that I that I got lucky enough to be able to have a lot of conversations about what makes scares is Jordan Peele, who's a, who's a buddy of mine, and and and, uh, and you know we talked about there's a moment in The Shining that I already referenced to you, like when Danny yeah. turns left and we see the two girls at the end of the hallway, like we, we were we were debating like why is that a scary moment. Like, what is it about that scene that's so terrifying? Yeah. And I was like, well, you know, it's, it's, it's scary that like they're, you know, they're wearing this blue dress and this like yellow hall, like the color is kind of like the color palette is sickly and they're not supposed to be there. And he's like, no, that's not what it is. I was like, well, it's, it's the audio. It's like, there's this like kind of a sound. And he's like, no, you know what it is, dude? He's like, it's that they're waiting for him we reveal them and they're already waiting there. And so when you see something yeah. that's waiting for you, it means they have a tactical advantage over you. You are immediately, the dynamic is set that they are predator and you are prey and they have a leg up. Like you are already yeah. on your back foot. You know what I mean? And that is off-putting and he's so right. And so there's a, there's a scene in Get Out where, where Daniel Kalia goes into the kitchen and the camera slides the maid into view and she's just sitting there at the kitchen island just staring at him waiting for him and it's creepy because it That's shows that she knows something he doesn't yeah and it makes him already i'm prey that predator and so what it, i use that in barbarian when when tess comes out of the bathroom and she walks she's just like washed her face and we yeah. she walks and we slide Keith into frame and he's already sitting there at the with table the with the wine and the glasses and he's just waiting for her. And it's a creepy, it's a creepy yeah. moment because he's been he's set a little trap. And now she is the prey, she's the prey, and he is the predator. I had to cut a hole in a wall so that I could put the camera there, so that I, I could like get that shot. Because I knew before I even went to Bulgaria, I was like, I want that shot to be this tracking shot that brings him into frame waiting for her because of that conversation that I had. And yes. so I was like, the camera couldn't fit there because there's a physical wall there. And I was like, then we're gonna cut the wall. And so we like, on that day, we had these guys come in with saws and just like cut the wall and like create this like, you know, thing for the camera to just slide along so that we could do it. I mean, it was on a stage, so it yeah. wasn't like I was in someone's house who was like freaking out. We could, we could do that. <laughs> would, would you but, mind? Um, you don't need this wall, like, an extension. Maybe? Yeah, I was like, we're going to go ahead and ruin your home here. Oh, it's a supporting wall. That's fine. We don't care. It's okay. The decor of the um, house, I feel, really worked without the wall. I think it just ruined. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's better this way. Now you can see into the hall when you're sleeping. You'll, you'll it's, thank you'll... me. Trust me. You'll yeah. thank me. Honestly, you're welcome. <laughs> there you go. Um, see, that's Hollywood privilege. You know what I'm saying? Just get it done yeah. like that. There you go. But I think that, that you know, that's, a, that's another example of like something that I, I, I learned from, you know, other, another hard director that I think really came in handy. Um, yeah, that's so fascinating. Yeah. I mean, so much of it, I feel, is just things we may not even realize that just automatically, you know, like whether it's something in our head or something, you know, subconsciously we see something that automatically unsettles us. It's really fascinating to me, especially with horror, because I can kind of understand how, you know, an action film is constructed, but a horror film, once you watch something that's great horror, you, you can't help but think, well, I don't know how they did that or what, what they did for that, but it's so fascinating. I mean, let me ask you this. 
as far as directing inspirations, I've heard a lot of directors say, oh, you can watch a Steven Spielberg film and you can tell that he's directed it. I'm not at that stage where I can really clock inspirations and stuff like that. But I mean, I, I, I think you can see some Sam Raimi in this. Oh, big movie. time. Yeah, I, and it's one shot in particular uh, with AJ and the camera like does that quick pan to him. And it's, it's just, it's an amazing scene. But I mean, there's a lot of Sam Raimi in this. Is there any other directors? Well, so my my rule for my cinematographer and I was Fincher upstairs, Raimi downstairs. You know, yeah, so everything yeah. everything upstairs is is Fincher. And now the the signature vocabulary that I found from Fincher is is you know his color palette is very muted and, and green and um and it's so muted that it's almost flamboyant. Buoyant. It almost pops out the other side and becomes like radical. Yeah. You know, I think you and, can see that in his work. Yeah, and so and but also to me, the thing that that I noticed the most about what Fincher does um, is that he he finds these amazing camera moves that are anchored to the character. So, for example, if if the character is sitting in a in a in a chair and they stand, the camera will rise with them just in that in that moment that they rise. It will stop when they stop, and then when they move, it will move with them. And what that does is it subconsciously really just roots you to the character. So I was very like, I was very conscious of like, I want to be with Tess all the time and I want to be moving when she moves and stop when she stops. And yeah. I want to always be kind of in her POV. Also Roman Polanski, I don't know if you know about his like the paranoia trilogy, but like Rosemary's Baby, The Apartment and The Tenant are all like about a woman's paranoia or I guess The Tenant is man's paranoia, but paranoia in the city. And what they, what he does that I really love is like, he keeps the camera always with the protagonist. So, so yeah. you know, Mia Farrow is always big in the frame and whoever she's talking to is a little more distant in the frame because we're in her mind. And so I use that too. So like when Tess is coming into the house and she's talking to Keith, we're close yeah. with Tess and he's in the distance, you know, because we're it's her story, it's her character. Um, and then when you get downstairs under the house, then it's all Sam Raimi. And that just means wide angle lenses, up close, yeah. big move, movement, you know, very kinetic. Uh, I, I just am a huge fan of his, and um, and so I have no problem stealing from him. And then the flashback, you know, in the 80s is uh, stealing uh, the motif from a couple of things, primarily Angst, which is an Austrian film from 1983, which is incredibly graphic and disturbing. I actually think you're probably, maybe you're not old enough to watch it yet. I don't know. I mean, you, I'm watching dude, it because you, you said I don't that. Know if I'm old enough to watch it. It's fucked. You shouldn't have said it because now I'm watching it. Now I'm right, watching well, it. It's, I'm telling you, man, it's, it's a very disturbing movie. Um, we'll do but, another uh, one. We'll do another one of these in a month and then we'll come back to me and, you know, we'll see how sick I do. If I throw up, okay. I'll give you, my, my parents will email you if it gets bad in my head. I yeah, don't know. Yeah. We'll, we'll get that sorted out. Get some, get some um, Hollywood cash money, baby. Get, get this wall knocked down. I'm wanting a mansion. You know what I'm saying? There you go. So, so, all right. Angst is fucked. Also, the other really super fucked up. There's three super fucked up movies that are kind of like go into Barbarian. One is Angst, yeah. which is like hardcore, dude. Dude, hardcore, hardcore. Is... If, it's, if it's foreign, then that means it's a little bit hardcore than it will be if it's American. Yeah, it's really hardcore. Um, they're all, they're all foreign. All three of these movies that I'm going to reference are foreign. So angst is Austrian, um, irreversible. Have you seen that by Gaspar Noah? It's oh, French. I know Gaspar Noah, dude. He's an amazing filmmaker. Which, what, yeah. What's that? Irreversible. Irreversible. And now that's a very superlatively fucked up movie. Okay. So Excuse my I'm ass. telling I'm gonna you now. I'm going to watch it anyway. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to watch it. Jesus, dude. It's, it's ruthless. And then the third one is audition. Have you seen audition? Is that... It's a 1999 Japanese film by Takashi Miike. If you no. don't know about Takashi Miike, you gotta I know, go. I, no, 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 no. I know about Takashi. That's one of his films. Obviously, of course, I know about Takashi Miike. No, 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 yeah. no, no. Okay, that's okay, yeah, dude. You. By, by the way, the fact that you know about Takashi Miike at your age is like amazing. Like you're you're killing it, dude. I'm. Dude, I'm, I try, but. To you. Oh, thank you so much. But then I have those days where it's like there's about a million films I have to watch. Man. Oh, I ha I have those too, man. I, yeah. I I saw Citizen Kane for the first time last year. You know, I mean, we <laughs> yeah. all have blind spots. It happens. Yeah. yeah. Um. So those three movies are all in Barbarian too. But anyway, so angst. Yeah, the the visual the visual vocabulary of angst is um is I just stole that for the flashback sequence and and I and then I blended it with um. 
elephant and there's there's the irish are elephant you, are you serious the, and elephant. i'm talking about the irish one not not gus van sant's homage but no the irish. I, yes irish the, yes. the 40 minute short film directed by Alan. that's Patrick, right produced by danny boyle yes yep dude yep. you know so about that was a big that was a big influence on on that flashback sequence as well yeah, you know about you know about elephant finally finally yeah, I've got yeah. to tell. i think elephant's amazing dude it's so good and i mean the shots, it just literally tracks. And I mean, that's, I feel like when we're talking about building dread, you know. Building that... dread, dude. It, oh my God. What, what's better than it? And I'll tell you this though. Gus Van Sant's elephant yeah. builds dread. And he's he's completely riffing on the Irish elephant. I mean, so yeah. much so he named it elephant. So like, obviously he's doing it on purpose. But I actually think that watching Gus Van Sant's elephant was like one of the most dreadful experiences i've ever had watching any movie ever because you're following these characters from behind on these long yeah. steady cam shots and you know it's gonna pop off any second and you don't know when or where and, and you I, don't know I whether the person unbearable. you're where the person you're following is going to be the one who gets shot or whether they do the shoot you don't know you, you don't know it, and the shot and it lingers you know it holds it lingers and like, forever and the longer it takes the more horrible it is yeah. it's scared me to death that's so good that's amazing and i there was one shot and he walks into a swimming pool and there's just a janitor and he just, you know, shoots him. And then yeah. you just, see, and dude, it's amazing. I mean, that's a period of time, which I feel is very fascinating, but that's the fact that you've seen that short film. That's, that's really amazing. You know what I'm saying? And like, you see that in a lot of directors, that shot where you track them from behind uh, mm -hmm. Martin McDonough recently with three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri, which is an amazing. Uh -huh. He did that as well. But I, I think you do see that shot, but you were inspired by that. Yeah. Yeah. Very much so, yeah. Amazing. But yeah, so let me ask you this, you know, as far as films go, you know, as far as directors go, do you have a favorite film or is that like the, the impossible question? Is there a list? I don't have a favorite film or a favorite director, you know, that's like, like yeah. what's your favorite song? I, I can't. But but I mean, the, the directors that have mattered the most to me are probably Kubrick, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, he, he's probably like, if I had to, if I had to say one, I, I would probably go for him. Um, and the Coen brothers, you know, I think that the Coen brothers are like, uh, like angels sent from heaven. And, uh, it's it, to me, every, I could watch any movie they've ever made a thousand times and, and learn something new every time I watch it. I just don't think there's anything better than them. Um, and so those are kind of my, my real diamonds. Uh, but then, you know, beyond, beyond that, I, I, you know, I, like you, I, I deeply, deeply love movies. So I love Fincher. I love yeah. Tarantino. I love Scorsese. I love Paul Thomas Anderson. I love Bennett Miller. I, you know, I, 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 I so Gaspar Noe, I, I adore. So there, oh, you know, good. it goes, it, Michael Haneke. I'm a big fan. Um, Paul Verhoeven. So I, you know, blah, 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 blah. I could just do this for an hour and a half. I only knew how to um, shoot what was in my head when I was writing it, you know? So I, for me, it was just like, I, I was I was writing it and as I was writing it, I had very clear, you know, images in my mind. And it took me, I don't know if you know this, but it took me, it took me years before anybody agreed to, to produce this movie. And so really? for, for two years, I, I really did watch this movie every night in my head as I went to sleep. I mean, I would, I would, I'm, I'm kind of obsessive. And so, I just, I just pretended, dude, this is embarrassing, but like I pretended to direct this movie all by myself. And this is my garage where I wrote it. I would be in here by myself and I would pretend to direct the whole movie, yeah. you know? And I mean, I, like, I, get I would that like act out like pantomime, like, okay, we're gonna put the camera here. We're gonna walk this way. Like, um, just because I wanted to just visualize how I would shoot it. And I wanted to be yeah. cl clear in my mind of like, what, what I needed. And, and I, so I would physically on my feet point out where that ca actors would walk and how the camera would move. And all of that changed, of course. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, I, I, I was locked in, dude. Like, and, and I think that you gotta be, you gotta be kind of irrational and obsessive to, to make something really cool. I, you know, um, and so it's kind of embarrassing, but it's also, it's like, yeah, that's my dude, process, man. I go, I, I go all in on it. I mean, dude, it shows how committed you are. I mean, no, but it was beautifully directed. And what I really love was that you introduced AJ. I, I was in cinema, so I couldn't really pause. I don't know. Was it 40 minutes in? Is that when AJ's? Yeah, like 40, 45. I don't know. Somewhere around there, yeah. Yeah, it seems like that. And I mean, the idea of like a secondary protagonist being introduced halfway through the film. I mean, it's something now I see so clear. But I, I watched a film by, I don't know if you know Derek C. in France, who directed Blue Valentine, uh, Place, Place yeah. Beyond the Pines. That's the film mm -hmm. I watched. 
and Place Beyond the Pine, Gosling's character, I don't want to talk about too much, but basically, well, a spoiler for a Place Beyond the Pine anyway, Gosling kicks the bucket and a, a new character is introduced halfway through. And then the, the rest of the film kind of follows him. And you see that Alan Clark elephant goodness. But it was just such a revolutionary idea to me. I was like, whoa, you can just have, a, you know, a second character introduced halfway through the film. And, you know, follow that and pick that up as a plot. I mean, introducing AJ, how did that decision come to you as a filmmaker? Did this Was this just all from the initial conception from the script? Did you notice from the start or were you just... No, writing? no, I didn't even want to write a movie. I just sat down to write a scene. And I'd, I had this idea of this double book there being B. It seemed like fertile territory for tension, but it was just for me. You know, it was yeah. not... Something supposed to be a film so i'm just writing you know tess and keith and obviously he in my mind he's the bad guy you know i didn't outline this movie i didn't think i i, I really didn't think one page ahead i just was like what's happening now what would be the coolest thing to happen next so i write i was writing it that way you know uh he gets down under the house you know they're they're in the tunnels and it's, it got to the point where it's like okay like you know he's lured her down there it's time for him to do whatever it is he's going to do. I'm sitting here thinking, I was like, okay, I don't know what he's going to do. What's he going to like inject her with a needle or like put her in a cage or, you know, what's he, what, what, what can I have him do? And I just had this moment where I was like, there's nothing he can do. Like there's nothing he can do yeah. that the audience has not seen coming because the moment he opens the door, everybody knows what they're watching, that he's bad and she's doesn't realize that she's been suckered in by this guy. And I hate this. Like, I, I literally was like, I've wasted 45 pages of my life. Like this, this sucks. And I was just staring at it. And then I just, I just, out of frustration, I was just like, a giant naked lady comes out and smashes him to pieces. And then I was like, oh, 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 oh I like it. Now I like it. Oh, fuck, but it's over. It's like a 45 minute short film. And then I was like, what would be the coolest thing for me to cut to next? Like what, what would be the, the most disorienting, what can I do? And I just, I swear to you, man, and I'm, I, I don't mean to sound like I'm a genius, but I, I, when I, this is just my truth. Yeah. I thought of the Pacific Ocean. I thought of an actor in a convertible. And I knew right then, like in, in one, one flash, yeah. I knew the rest of the movie. I was like, he owns the house. He's getting canceled. He's got to go back under the house. They, they cross paths. She's still alive. Boom. And, and I just, I was like, that's what it is. And, and I just, I just followed, I just followed that, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, David Lynch and his writing process. Right. And so he has, I don't know if you've read his book called catching the big fish, but no, it's what's really his an writing amazing process. Book. No, I haven't heard this. What, so his what? writing process is this. Um, it's all about transcendental meditation. So um, I don't know if you've ever learned TM. Do you know about this? No, this okay. is all just, this is like new, new news to me. No, tell me about it. Okay. So transcendental meditation is like a mantra based meditation, right? You do it twice a day for 20 minutes. It's really easy to do. It's not hard. It's not, you don't have to clear your mind. You know, I've tried all kinds of meditation and this was the first one where I was like, oh, I can do it. Yeah. It's just, you basically, it's just as simple as you sit, you sit down, you close your eyes and you just recite a mantra and you don't try and stop your brain. You just let your brain be your brain, but you just keep this mantra running. And as you, as you like run this mantra in the background, what will happen is you will begin to enter a subconscious trance state. And in that trance state, as you get deeper and deeper down away from your conscious mind, you, it feels like you're on drugs on I mean, I feel yeah. physically like, yeah, I, I really do. Like, I, I feel like crazy. I go deep. And are you telling me that, I can get high from my house? Yeah, man. It's, and it's really good for you. And it's really good for you. And it clears you up. It puts you in a better mood. It makes you sharp. It gives you energy. It's really an amazing tool. And what it does also is creatively, uh, while you're down there in your subconscious, in this trance, ideas that you could not like decide on will come to you. And he refers to that as you, you're, you're fishing and you catch big fish. And so I would, um, I like to, and I'm not, I don't always do this, but yeah. I like to meditate before I write kind of with, with thinking like, okay, here's what I, I have. Here's the problem I have. Cause writing is always for me, a series of, of running into dead ends and feeling like I've, I'm stuck. I don't know what yeah. to do. So that if I meditate and I just, I know that problem is there oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes I'll get some weird work around some new idea will come in my subconscious mind. And then when I come out of my meditative trance, I will write that. And so what mantra did you repeat? I can't tell you. Yeah, is that the trick? 
everyone gets their own individual mantra and you can't tell anyone else. So I, I, I can't tell you, but it's a two syllable word. And, um, you know, and I, I highly encourage you if you're curious about it to learn more and, and there's probably a TM center near you and you should check it out. It's really, it's really an amazing tool. And um, yeah, so anyway, so, so that helps me a lot in the writing process. And, 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 you know, the movie I'm writing now, I'm writing in a very different way than I wrote Barbarian. I'm still using transcendental meditation, but it's, it's a lot more like a house of cards. Like the story is very intricate and it has a lot more moving parts. So I, I can't just kind of like flow. I have to like have note cards and like, you know, really think about how this ties into that. It's kind of frustrating, but I think it'll be good. Um, but anyway, um, I, I've lost my train of thought, but, uh, that's, that's kind of my process. Yeah. Dude, that's so fascinating. I mean, yeah, totally. I, that's complete news to me. I hadn't heard about that before. And, but no, Check his a book out. Check his book out. Catching the big fish. David Lynch. David Lynch. Oh, yeah. this is David Are you Lynch a fan writer. of his? Yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Okay, I'm all right. Huge David Lynch fan. Amazing, yeah. amazing filmmaker. Um, but no, that's what I really love about AJ, especially as a character is that there's this moment and like he's done a horrible thing. And I mean, there's this kind of moment halfway through where uh, it's third act of the film. You know, you kind of see this glimmer, this flame of redemption. And then it just gets snuffed out kind of the next scene. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And it's so yeah. I mean, I'm a sucker for, you know, redemption films and stuff like that and forgiveness and penance. I mean, one of my favorite films is In Bruges. So here, I don't know if you've ever seen In Bruges. Oh, yeah, it, of course. I love it. Oh, dude, it's a fantastic film. But yeah, In Bruges. Have is you the main seen the new one? Is the new one good? Yeah, I got to go to the red carpet premiere. I got to interview Colin Farrell, Brendan Gleeson, and uh, Martin cool. McDonough. The most terrified I've ever been. It was my stupid name printed next to like actual news people, and I was sitting there thinking, "Oh, I'm gonna make an arse out of myself." But no, oh, they were buddy, good. I'm sure they're all so excited to talk to you, man. Yeah, uh, do you, Banshees of Inisherin. Are you gonna Are you gonna check that out? I'm very, of course, I am. I'm. It, I think it looks fantastic. I'm. I'm very excited to watch. It's amazing. I mean, it's literally it's filmed up in Galway, which is kind of the west of Ireland. It's on the Aran Islands, and it's so crazy to me to see. Like these big American filmmakers, like looking forward to seeing a film set in Ireland. It just shows how great Martin McDonough. Richard Brake is fantastic in this man. I got to meet Richard when he came to Dublin. Uh, he, he went to a convention here in Dublin, I think, a, a few years ago. But he's really nice. What was it like getting to work with you know that star-studded cast? I mean, did you craft when you were writing? Did you have this cast planned in your head, or what was? No, I I, I didn't write with any actors in mind. Um, because you know, first-time filmmaker, I didn't think it was going to be a movie, so I didn't I didn't think about it like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, of course, I was thrilled when when it all kind of came, it took the shape it took. You know, Richard was perfect. Bill, Justin, George. I mean, they were all just exactly what I needed. I got I got really lucky. Yeah. I mean, dude, and I think I, I think just the world of horror is something that's so fascinating to me. Do you want to stick to horror as a filmmaker or are you looking to, you know, I'm more than happy to. At the moment, you know, I, I don't really I, I kind of don't feel like I am capable of deciding what I do next because mm. The ideas that come to me are the ideas that come to me. I don't get to just sit here and think like, I would love to do a goofy comedy that will be great. You know, like I don't, my brain doesn't work that way. I, I, I feel like I have to just be open to receive any idea in the ether and, and it's it, whatever kind of lodges and infects me and becomes yeah. an obsession is not up to me. It's just, that's the idea. So I, I, all I can do is stay open. And so the idea that is, lodged in me currently that will hopefully be my next movie if i'm lucky enough to make another movie is actually is another horror really? um so so the next one you know god willing is is a horror movie but after that who knows same vein as barbarian or something a bit weirder <laughs> weirder than <laughs> barbarian dude. yeah it's definitely weirder than barbarian <laughs> um i don't think it's as gross as barbarian you know barbarian has kind of a griminess to it and i don't think this is as grimy but it's it's definitely, it's it's darker. I think it's a darker movie than Barbarian, but I but I like it a lot. It's and I think it's a little more adult. Yeah. But um, but I think it's going to be very scary. I hope. Amazing. If I um, if I pull it off. If well, I mean, you know, that's I think that's all you know Hollywood is. Let me ask you this. I mean, this is probably something that's completely taken out of context, which I find news articles tend to do. Uh, you know, you recently talked about a Gotham DC project. Is that some? Is that your dream project? Well, yeah. So before I wrote Barbarian, I wrote a. Uh, I had it, and and I'm not interested in superhero movies at all. Like I actually don't like. 
I don't like those kinds of movies. I don't watch them. But I, you know, again, in the spirit of, I really mean it when I say it's not up to me what ideas I, 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 I use. I had this idea for this movie that takes place in Gotham City, and I could not get it out of my head. And uh, it just wouldn't go away. And I thought it was like the coolest thing ever. And so I, I remember I was shooting a, a TV show that I was just acting in, in Fiji. And um, I don't drink uh, anymore. I'm like a sober guy. I'm like a recovering mm-hmm. kind of a dude. And everyone else in, in my show drank like crazy. And so at night, I, I you know, I was there for, for three months. And I just had this thing where I was like, Every night I can either hang out with the same drunk people, which is fine, more power, all good. Or, but you know, if you're not drinking, it gets a little boring. So I can, I can keep hanging out with the same drunk people, or I can go back to my little area and just write. And so I wrote this Batman movie uh, in my evenings while I was shooting the show. And I just fell like deeply, deeply in love with this movie. And so, you know, obviously Batman and the DC universe is like the most, valuable ip in the world and and i'm not expecting anyone to give me the keys to that car anytime soon but but one day you know if my career goes goes well you know i would love to i would love to make that movie so we'll see dude that'd be fascinating i mean you know you talked about drinking here in ireland we all remain sober so i mean it's kind of i've heard that a crazy concept i mean drinking yeah, yeah. drinking i mean do you just like like how how can you do it? I mean, I've really, it's such a such a shocking experience to me. I mean, no, basically, no, it's true, Ireland. We're full of drunks, and I can say that because you know, it's well, my family's Irish. I come from yeah, so I'm. Oh, Irish then that makes it. that makes you one of us. Where in Ireland? I, I, dude, I don't know. It's generations ago. Fair enough. This is the thing in America. All these people want to be something that they're not. So it's not me the saying same. like. I'm Irish. It's like, I'm not, Irish. I mean, I'm American, dude. I'm just like a bland American, but my family, you know, four generations back is, is Irish. I'll give you an honorary Irish pass. So okay. You, thank you. You can make thank leprechaun you. jokes. I'm okay with that now. <laughs> so there you go. That's what you get. You know I mean? I'll, okay, I'll cool. I'll get it printed on a card or something. Dude, it was this conscious, cause this is so crazy. I saw this on Twitter. Barbarian being an anagram for Airbnb. I didn't even think about that um, until Get someone out of here. Twitter... You didn't think about it? No, I, I promise you I didn't. But it goes even deeper than that. So Barbarian is an anagram of Airbnb, which I remember I read that and I was like, oh my God, it is. That's crazy. <laughs> am I a genius? Is that... I was like, am I smart? Is I that might translucent actually be smart. meditation, you know? Yeah, well, and then it gets crazier, dude. So the address of the house is 476 Barbary. Believe me when I tell you, that was just a random number I picked. But then yeah. on Twitter, people were like, 476 is the year that Rome was sacked by the barbarians. I was like, is that true? And it is true. And then it gets even crazier. Barbarian, the word, comes from uh, the Greeks, I believe. uh, It was a pejorative. It was an insult that they used against, I think, the Persians, where they thought that their language sounded like someone just going like, bar, 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 bar. So they called them barbarians as like an insult and that's yeah. where the term comes then it, it changed to mean anyone who's not one of us so like a savage who's like not part of us is a barbarian but it comes from mocking the bar 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 and what is the only syllable that the mother says in the whole movie bar 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 yeah. bar 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 barbarian i mean like that that i was like okay that's just crazy but i i promise you it's i'm not are that you, smart are it you wasn't... secretly a genius are you secretly... yeah I, that's what i thought i was like wait a minute am i a genius i but no the answer to that is is certainly no i think um, i think i'm smart you know exactly. I mean? <laughs> yeah do i yeah. what do i do now how do, do i drink with my pinky up i mean what? What's yeah, yeah. Do? how do i how do i parlay this into something what's the etiquette can i can I write my own book? Can I do an autobiography? Yeah. Have I earned it? Dude, yeah. I mean, no, that that's so amazing. But seeing something like Barbarian succeed, I mean, as successfully as it did, is it a bit phenomenal to you? Or, I mean, I think you mentioned this in an interview, but you kind of believe if a film is good, it'll always find its audience. Is that how you feel? Well, I think for a horror film, yeah. I just, yeah. I, I, you tell me, uh, my my theory about horror is that there is no such thing as a genuinely scary a genuinely scary good horror movie that is ignored. Yeah. They're not ignored. They can't be because horror fans are ravenous for quality. And when they find something good, they will tell everyone. They just, that's yeah. the way it always is with horror. Like there's, there are no, there are no terrifying great horror films that, that are like under the radar. Yeah. I, I defy you to tell me one. 
dude i yeah I, I i i i think i agree with that you know i mean horror is such a fascinating thing and i don't know how to articulate it i don't know what it is but i always there's just something different about it from a lot of you know from action mm-hmm. and comedy and it's it's a good different but i i just don't know how to articulate but it's really fascinating i mean horror as a genre i mean getting to talk with filmmakers is something i'm still like it's just kind of baffling to me but it, it's really horror is a really interesting genre and seeing successful horror is always amazing and like look people you know, I'll complain nowadays about original films are dying, you know, and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've heard it before. Barbarian being, you know, as successful as it is, you know, it's amazing. That's a completely original film. So let me ask you this. Is there any IP you'd ever see yourself working on? I mean, DC, is that the big one? Um, I'm just focused on writing my 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 own stuff right now. Yeah. Um, There's been a lot of conversations about some existing IP. I can't really talk about it. Yeah. But sure. I don't think it's going to happen. Um, you know, my, my, all of my heroes kind of forged their own path, writing their own movies. And, um, you know, I, I want to, I want to look back on my body of work. I hope I have a body of work beyond barbarian. And I, and I, and I hope that it consists mostly of things that I write. Um, now if, if something comes along, that's just amazing and I can, and I can make it unique to me and put my spin on it so it feels like almost like an original i'm open to it but but right now it's like i'm kind of obsessed with this new idea i'm working on and so i'm gonna i'm who knows what'll happen after that i i can only do one thing at a time so i'm, I'm focused on this i feel like i feel like i got to interview jordan peele like on his first film that's how i feel getting to interview I'm like you know in a few years you'll be a huge household name and i'll be like oh sax good mate of mine you know we, we talked about <laughs> you can say love. that buddy you can yeah, say it it. if i'm honorary iris then 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 we are friends and I'm then that friend. means you can make any leprechaun jokes you want you know it all works yeah, yeah, out. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll smoke my cigars i said i knew him when he was young he was nice you know before <laughs> before the fame got to his head and there were pictures of him in a, a jacuzzi and stuff like that i don't know it's a <laughs> different story i mean yeah hollywood will go to your head but uh yeah. no listen your dc script i'm about to make it better there's a character in the dc universe called condiment king now i mean you've probably never heard of this character but i brought him up in all my interviews and uh, i'm just gonna go pitch it to dc i figure i'll just you can pay for my ticket out to la i'll just go knock on their office pitch it i think Someone's running it now. Uh, Patton Oswalt, when I interviewed him, I convinced him to star in it. Damon Lindelof and David Goyer are co-writing it. Basically, Condiment King, right, is a villain who shoots ketchup and mustard out of his gun at people. His real name is Mitchell Mayo. And I think that just says so much about capitalism, you know? So It's deep. There you go. I mean, if we say it's about grief, we might win an Oscar. I think that's how it works. <laughs> if you say it's about grief, welcome to Hollywood. Yeah, it's a <laughs> metaphor for grief. Could get you anything. Do you think? Do you think we'll get an Academy Award? Is it that oh easy? Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> if it's we say a it's metaphor about... for grief, I love it. <laughs> we'll win an Oscar. But there you go. He shoots yeah. ketchup and mustard. You know, he's a real, real character. And um, but no, I mean, Zach. Before we finish up, my last couple of questions. I mean. What do you think you've learned from your, you know, your directorial debut that you'll hold and remember for your next film? Is there one piece of information that you learned in particular to make your next film easier for you as a filmmaker? Well, I learned a really wonderful um, workflow process from my cinematographer, this guy, Zach Cooperstein. And basically what we did is we went to every location uh, weeks in advance before we, before we filmed to photo board the whole movie. And so we use this app called, I think it's called Artemis and you pick the lens and we pick the angle and we, we just, we, we got to have all those kind of like dumb idea conversations about how to cover every scene where there's no producer standing there tapping their watch and no actor making you feel stupid because you don't know it yet. So, so we got to go and just really like map out the whole movie well in advance so that by the time we showed up on set, we had a big poster board up and we had photos of every every angle from every lens. So all I had to do was like, make sure it looked good in the frame and talk to the actors, you know, because the blueprint was there. Obviously you have to be prepared to like throw all of that out the window. If an actor has an idea or somebody has an idea or something goes wrong, cause it's always going to yeah. go wrong, but it, it just really made the whole process for me so much easier being so well prepared and all my favorite filmmakers or most of them, not all, but most of them, most of them are very, very prepared. You know, Ari Aster is very prepared. The Coen Brothers storyboard everything. You know, um, Alfred Hitchcock would storyboard the whole movie. And I feel like if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. And um, now maybe, you know, Werner Herzog is a, is a more of a genius than all of us because he thinks that shot lists are, are for cowards. But, you, you know, for, 
Oh yeah. Yeah. He's very clear about that. He thinks shot lists are for cowards. Um, but you know what? I, I think that that's, that's just, he's crazy. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's his, that's his vibe. Like you can't tell all musicians how they should prepare for their concerts. He's like, that's like yeah. some guy being like, I'm a jazz musician. And if you don't play jazz like me, you're a coward. It's like, well, I don't subscribe to that. I, you know, art is bigger than, than you bro. And so I want to make precise, thoughtful shot choices. And, um, not to say it's better or worse. It's just, that's my myth anyway. So, but that method, I, I really, I really appreciated using on this. I'll probably use that at least for my next movie. And, um, and then also, um, what else did I learn? You know, sometimes you, this is going to sound shitty, but I learned that like, there are moments where you just have to be the asshole as a director, you know, you have to recognize that like, people might not want to do what you're going to ask them to do. You know, sometimes someone's going to do something three times and three different iterations and it's not working. And I'm talking about like a prop or a set decoration or the wall color or a performance or a piece of music. And you're going to have to ask if it's not right, you can't take the easy path and be the nice guy. You have to be a bastard and say, it's still not right. And I need you to do it again. And that is really hard to do, but you have to keep in your mind that like, in 10 years, this movie is going to be what it's going to be. And that guy's not going to remember this conversation, you know, but I'm, my name is on the movie and it's, it has to be the best yeah. I can make it. So, you know, I, I, I have to be, I have to be very demanding and there's a nice way to do it. And you always want to be respectful and courteous and, and, and the, the, the key to doing this right is to make people feel as enthusiastic about the final product as you feel. And so, yeah. you know, you want everyone to feel like a creative partner not just like your your tool um sure sure. but there's inevitably going to be moments where people are frustrated and tired and they don't want to do their job and it's not that they don't want to do their job they just don't want to do they just don't want to do whatever you're asking them to do yeah that's just gonna happen and you just have to be like you have to be tough and you have to just think to yourself i knew this was going to happen at some point here it is right on schedule and i got to deal with this and That was hard. That's a hard lesson. Dude, that's really fascinating. I mean, I think, you know, you talk about, you know, sometimes you just can't compromise on anything. I think it was Jared Hess who said this, but it's a famous quote. I I, I don't want to say it's from Kurosawa because I may be wrong, but, you know, a uh, film dies on a hill of a thousand compromises. I'm sure you've heard uh-huh. that at some point. Yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah. Death by a thousand cuts. Yeah. That kind yeah, of yeah. That, the film, yeah, but... You know, compromising is something in film. And it's kind of really fascinating. I've talked with a lot of filmmakers and I told them how much I've loved their films. They'd be like, yeah, it could have been better. I could have done that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I'm always like, well, how can you see that? But I mean, can you can you watch Barbarian? And like, can can you even can you enjoy it? I mean, can you appreciate it? I can enjoy it. I, I, and maybe maybe this is a deficiency of mine. Look, every time yeah. I watch it, I still th- see things that I want to change. You know, I would love to go back in the edit and tweak and adjust and and trim things out and and all of that you know I, I you're never done david fincher says movies are never finished they're abandoned you know and um i agree with him but i also recognize that like nothing's ever going to be perfect and and barbarian is by no means perfect but i'm really proud of it you know and i and i really enjoy watching it with audiences and hearing yeah. people react to it and and i do get a lot of pleasure from it now i've made other things that i certainly do not feel that way about um, so I, I know myself, I know I'm not like, just like a self-indulgent weirdo. Like there's yeah. a lot I've made that I'm kind of ashamed of and will never watch again. But I, I do think Barbarian is, is pretty close to, to what I, what I was aiming for. And so I'm, for that, I'm very appreciative. Dude, you totally, I mean, achieved that. Like my, my dad laughed at the measure and tape scene. Oh, good. And you, if you got a chuckle out of my dad, you're doing something right. So there you go. You got, you got a <laughs> okay, laugh good. out of my dad. So there you go. I mean. I think you can get that frame, get a quote. I mean, like we said, Academy Award doesn't really matter, you know, when you got a laugh out of uh, my dad. Yeah. So there yeah. you go. That's more important. But I love that Fincher quote. Uh, well, the Fincher quote you brought up, but um, I heard this, it was this such a funny story. I mean, like Fincher's a perfectionist. And I mean, he has every right to be. He is one of the greatest filmmakers to ever do it. And I think he finished Alien and he was going on to Seven. And he was really looking forward to Seven and he was really excited to do Seven. And, you know, because he wanted another opportunity after making Alien, which, I mean, I think he felt wasn't his best work. And while he was making Seven, he seemed rather sad. I think a producer went up to him and said, you know, like, David, what, what's the matter with you? And he said, you know, 
uh, the producer said, aren't you happy you finally get the chance to make another film? And Fincher looked up and said, no, I'm miserable because now I have to, you know, make all of you understand my vision. And that's it. Like, that's just the number one Fincher story to just to show. I mean, you know, as a director, are you a perfectionist or sometimes are you willing to just say, this is the best we're going to get? We have to cool. Uh, a little of both. You know, I think there's a little of both. I, I don't think I'm a perfectionist in the way Fincher is. I, I, I don't think I did anything more than... I remember the, the the scene where Richard Brake gets out of the car and opens the trunk and pulls the jumpsuit out and like that says Carlos. I think I did like 15 takes of that, but that's just because like uh, the trunk kept breaking. You know, we couldn't get the trunk to work and the or the camera move wouldn't be right. So it's like we're not gonna we're not gonna stop until we get it. You know, like I, I'm not gonna not have the shot work right. So we're gonna yeah. keep going until it's correct. But 15 takes for some people. Everyone on set that day thought I was being too hard. I think they were like, you don't need to do this 15 times. But then also 15 takes is like nothing compared to what yeah. Fincher does. I mean, he does a hundred takes sometimes. So I, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't no, The think... important thing to remember is at least I'm not Fincher crew. At least we could be doing this a hundred times. Be grateful that's only 15. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, or Nancy Myers, you know, Nancy Myers will do a hundred takes, you know? Really? And... I didn't notice. I know. And isn't that weird? Like of all the perfectionists, I wouldn't expect yeah. Nancy Myers to be like an obsessive Kubrickian obsessive, but she's uh, dedicated to her craft. Twice. What's that? She's dedicated to her craft. You know what? I'm Very saying? much so. There you go. But though, dude, that's so fascinating. I cannot wait to see what you do next. Uh, Zach, my final question before I let you go, I'm so sorry for taking up so much of your time. No, it's uh, my pleasure. Dude, let me just ask you this. What advice would you have for anyone looking to become a filmmaker? Well, I would say, right. I think, I think that uh, one thing that is very clear to me is that power comes from writing, you yeah. know, and um, you don't have to pitch yourself for existing IP or like try and try and convince somebody that like you're the director for this movie, because if you write the movie, you know, you, you, you own it, you know, you own it in every way you own it legally, you own it creatively, it's yours. And so I think anyone who's who's serious about being a, a filmmaker should really focus and it's free to do you can write for free, you know, and you should write every day. I don't do this. I don't follow my own advice. But I think, you know, if I if I did, I'd be a better filmmaker and I'd be more successful if I at your age had decided I will write five pages a day. Yeah. And I'd, if I'd stuck to that every day, I, I, I wonder what my life would be like now, you know? Really? Yeah, I think I'd be in a different situation, but um, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. But, you know, it just, it, it's, it's like a muscle that you work out. It really is. Writing is a muscle. Filmmaking is a muscle. All of these things, you know, it, I, I don't believe that people are just like auteurs. I think everybody has to, has to put in the work and, um, so yeah, even though then Paul Thomas Anderson comes along and makes Boogie Nights when he's like 20 something and it's like the greatest movie of all time and God damn it, I don't know how he did it. He just is a, he, he is a genius, but Paul is also an obsessive and, and I, I don't know him, I can't call him Paul, but like, but like that guy, believe it, you know, lives, eats, breathes, thinks about nothing but films and filmmaking and probably did ever since he was eight years old, you know? So like he's, he has put in the work. Um, so all I, I have think... to do is make Boogie Nights. Yeah, yeah. right. Ugh. Okay. I mean, I think I think Boogie Nights is like is uh, is a miracle. Do you have, I think do you have Marky movie's... Mark's number to hook me up for for Boogie Nights? You <laughs> I know? do not get it going. No, well, there you go. Just like that, I lost my shot. Could it just Boogie Nights about grief? <laughs> it's like boogie nights but about grief dude it, here's here's 10 million dollars get out of here go and what it. if we make it sad and uh cast a foreign actor in it put it up for best picture best <laughs> yeah. screenplay do it all i'll do my speech at the oscars and it'll be a miracle so there you go so that's my plan honestly out of all that good advice i i took yeah make boogie nights so you know listen there you go yeah, well hey there that might work for you uh, Zach, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to chat with me, sir. I'll chat with you a little bit off air. Before we finish up, are you on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, anything like that? I'm on Twitter and Instagram. I think I'm like Z Kreger, I think. Um, I'm not hard to find. Uh, I'm, on, I'm on all that stuff. Any, and any, uh, I'm not on Facebook. No, any project you can promote or talk about? Any new, I mean, Barbarian, the big one? Barbarian, uh, I, I've been raising money for a Whitest Kids movie. Uh, we've been kind of crowdfunding this cartoon called Mars. It's an animated feature. We, we, uh, 
you know, we recorded all of the all of the voices and everything for it before my partner Trevor died. I don't know if you know that uh, Trevor from Whitest Kids died last year, um, but before he did, we recorded all the all the voices. So it's going to be what it needed to be all along. He's in it, and uh, we're we're raising money on that. So on my Twitter, I have a pinned tweet if anyone's interested. Dude, I'm so uh, but sorry I'm excited to hear for that. that to come out. Yeah, I'm so sorry to hear sorry? that. And I'm so sorry to hear that. But let me just oh, ask yeah, you, yeah, is there you. a link for that? I can link it in the description. Is there a link where people can go check it out? Yeah, uh, I have a pinned tweet with a link in it. Uh, oh, perfect. So... I'll get the link from there. Everyone, there'll there be a go. link for that in the description. Go check it out. Uh, but Zach, I'll talk to you a little bit off air. But yeah, everyone, thank you guys so much for watching. You follow me over on Twitter if you'd like, uh, Daniel Fee 33. Please make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, if you have the means, please make sure to donate to the National Deaf Children's Society. that will be top link in the description. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching. And Zach, thank you so much for taking the time to me, sir. We'll do this again. Uh, you know, I'll go, I'll watch that Gaspar. I'll watch the Gaspar No Irreversible. I'll watch the Austrian film. He said, and I'll go back. I'll watch every Every film you mentioned, we'll do this again in a month, and we'll talk about them. There okay, you, you will be you will be a, a hollowed out young man <laughs> if you watch all three of those. I don't movies. want to make a film about grief anymore. <laughs> there you go, Zach. Yeah. Thank you so much for chatting. I'll touch you off, everybody. Yeah, thank you guys so all much right. for watching. Thanks for having me.